Hello and welcome to StarCast from Planet Waves. My name is Eric Francis Coppolino, the host of Planet Waves FM and the author of the Planet Waves Horoscope. The monthly Horoscope is set to come out on Thursday evening. Check your email, check the website, check Facebook, check whatever. Thank you for uh, brooking a slight delay in uh, this program. I was diligently writing away. Uh, last night, then had to rush out to a dinner meeting where I was set up uh, for a uh, pre-interview with someone claiming to be the half-sister of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. That story did not check out, but dinner was kind of fun, and I am here (laughs) with you (laughs) in the morning. Uh, Some stories do not withstand five minutes of fact-checking. Okay, so uh, this is part one of uh, Sagittarius Total Solar Eclipse uh, series of StarCasts. There'll be two of those. Uh, I'll probably be back with another one on on Friday. Um, uh, Let's work backwards. The solar eclipse is at 2.42 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, on Saturday, so that's overnight, Friday to Saturday, uh, in all time zones uh, across uh, the Canada, United States, uh, Mexico, Europe, United Kingdom, uh, and Eastern Europe, etc., 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 and uh, and down under, it would appear this eclipse takes place somewhere the afternoon of the fourth. By the way, this eclipse is visible from the South Seas, for example. Uh, it goes clear over Antarctica, uh, where there's not a lot of people <laughs> down there. But we've had some readers in Antarctica. We had the uh, the Antarctic contingent. This was in the early 2000s. So I wonder where they went. Uh, and uh, it will be visible as a partial from places with a kind of a view in the direction of Antarctica, for example, such as Southern Australia. And uh, and this, uh, to me, is a picture of uh, what is going on down in Australia, which is uh, attempting to lock down as a kind of a pseudo-police state at this time. Uh, it's not going all that well. They are convincing a fair number of people, however, that they need to uh, keep shooting up and maybe, you know, get an insulin pump with this uh, stuff uh, on the word on their belt or between their boobs uh, stuck into their bra as is sometimes done with insulin pumps tick 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 pump it in pump it in uh, and by the way speaking of things like insulin pumps and things going on in the south seas in the path of the total solar eclipse where it'll be seen as a partial which is good some of these audios are being taken off of YouTube. I just want to mention that if if you saw heard something on YouTube, they're really getting picky if they're censoring astrology audios on YouTube that happen to mention things like insulin pumps. But in any event, you can find me at starcast.fm. Starcast.fm. Okay, back to astrology. So this eclipse takes place 250 242 54 meaning 2.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, And this is the last of the series of total of eclipses of any kind on the Gemini Sagittarius axis for the next nine years. The eclipses move uh, in a a nine-year cycle. The lunar nodes have an 18-year cycle, so they flip positions every nine years. The south node has been moving through Sagittarius for about the past year and a half. That's how long that takes. And the North Node has been moving through Gemini for the past year and a half. That's They, they, tra- they travel together. Hold on, I've got the EMS radio crackling here in the background. So turn that down. So um, so the, the eclipses, therefore, have loosely followed Gemini and Sagittarius the past year and a half that you know there's been some overlap on cancer capricorn and we had a taurus eclipse two weeks ago taurus eclipse of the moon two weeks ago it's not strictly clockwork it it's approximate and there are events on the fringe Um, and in any event this is the last of the eclipses on the gemini sagittarius axis and what is the most interesting thing about this eclipse in my view is that it takes place 
very close to a point called the Great Attractor. Uh, that is uh, currently at about 14 degrees and a couple of arc minutes of Sagittarius. However, for most of us who are adults, the Great Attractor was at about 12 degrees and change of Sagittarius. It moves very slowly because it's a fixed point. It doesn't really move. It precesses with the wobble of the Earth. It precesses in seemingly direct motion. And so from the time I was very little, the, uh, the Great Attractor has moved about a degree uh, and so anyway, this, um, and then th probably you, if you're, you know, if you have uh, any uh, gray hair at all, maybe one of them. Uh, and so the, the total solar eclipse, which is a powerful eclipse, right? They're not all eclipses, not totals. Uh, and uh, though this is not the most powerful eclipse uh, of our lifetimes, uh, it is certainly uh, amplified by its presence on the great attractor. And this is uh, the nature of the great attractor is to amplify things, but it also has a way of placing some distance between us and that which would pursue us, that which would stalk us. And so um, if you have mid mutables prominent in your chart, by which I mean the sun conjunct, the moon conjunct, something important square or opposite 14-ish uh, or 12-ish, 13-ish Sagittarius, uh, you're, you're picking up the great attractor and you have some of these properties. Now, what is this thing? This thing is the focal point of 100,000 galaxies. If you are interested, 100,000, let me finish this sentence, 100,000 galaxies basically are being, it's not quite like they're being, okay, so <laughs> astrophysics is largely theoretical, and, uh, and, and the physicists, I think, do a better job of explaining things than do virologists, for example, because the physicists at least admit what they don't know, whereas the virologists do not. But in any case, the best concept of the great attractor that I have comes directly from its co-discoverer, a man named Brent Tully, who I interviewed a couple of years ago. I put that interview on the front of planetwaves.fm, planetwaves.fm. You can see it right there, Lania Kea and the great attractor. Lania Kea is this structure of 100,000 galaxies, which are all being drawn toward this point in mid-Sagittarius. God knows what's there. Uh, Brent Tully says that it's a massive pool of subatomic particles. If someone can explain that to me uh, better than Brent Tully did, I would love to hear it. Um, and uh, in any event, it, it is this um, gravitational anomaly that's broadcasting on every frequency except for visible light. And we don't really know exactly what this thing is, but it is typical of structures in the universe. And um, the, the odd contradiction that it presents is that things are being drawn toward it. So the galaxies that all surround us, the local group, the Virgo group, and then the larger structure of Laniakea are all being drawn together while overall the universe is expanding. Now, this is a curious thing. And I ran this past Brent Tully when I was able to formulate the question. And you can see if you go to the Laniakea Great Attractor uh, program at the very top of planetwaves.fm, right below the player, I present my correspondence with Brent Tully, and, uh, and he explains this seeming contradiction between the galaxies all around us converging on one point in Sagittarius, but the entire universe, meaning all the galaxies in the universe, expanding. And I think that that contradiction of is it expanding, is it contracting, what is happening to us locally, what is happening in the larger scene are contained in this um, in this point called the Great Attractor. One of the privileges of my job, or maybe it's my karma, is that I've got a professor for everything, you name it, and I, I either have or can find a professor, though I will admit that I had a hard time finding someone who would tell me about moon rocks. Moon rocks. I even had a guy from UCLA a top professor of astronomy and astrophysics at UCLA lie to me about moon rocks. Why cover up moon rocks? Come on, man. I thought this is just a perfectly logical question. Geologists, you know, well, 
he was an astrogeologist and he had actually smelled what he claimed to be moon rocks. Okay, anyway, <laughs> moving along from my professor Karma, let's go back to the present moment of the present chart. Uh, I'm recording a little before 10 a.m. Eastern Time on December 1st. The moon has just entered Scorpio. Um, it did so early this morning, Eastern Time, somewhere around, uh, I'm, I'm guessing around uh, 6.30, a little, maybe a little bit before 7 a.m. Uh, and uh, the moon has joined Mars in Scorpio. Um, it will be making aspects to everything on the fixed cross over the next couple of days, and that includes, in particular, um, a, uh, an opposition to Uranus, which is going to happen overnight. What day is today? Today's Wednesday. Overnight, Wednesday to Thursday, in, 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 in about 20 hours uh, from now. Um, and so that's... Uh, kind of a magnetic sensation it's it's the sense of whatever you're feeling approaching a shake-up point a a wake-up point speaking of i learned from reading the new york post horoscope my very favorite one of the very few astrologers whom i actually trust sally brompton in the new york post i hardly ever miss a day uh reminded me that neptune stationed direct today uh, Neptune is a planet of delusion and of denial and dreaming and drink and drugs and the station direct is a kind of a wake-up call. Uh, Neptune is officially approaching the third decanate. It is in it now actually the third decanate of Pisces. Uh, so it is at the end, well it has a third of the way to go and it takes a heck of a long time to get from uh, let's say from point A to point B, meaning the beginning of Pisces to the end of Pisces. Uh, but in any event, Neptune is direct in Pisces. It's doing so uh, when Venus in Capricorn is making an exact sextile. So it's almost like Venus has come along to wake up Neptune and, and remind us to wake up and be practical. Um, Venus in Capricorn certainly is practical, perhaps a little too much. It's very Earth Girl-ish. One of my favorite uh, cap, uh, Venus placements is, you know, anything Earth Girl-ish will get my attention. That certainly qualifies for Venus in, uh, in Capricorn. And so uh, we've got this beautiful Venus aspect today uh, on the day that Neptune stations. And speaking of beautiful Venus aspects, Mars is in Scorpio, and over the next few days, Venus is going to be making a sextile uh, to uh, Mars and Scorpio. So now Scorpio is a um, allegedly a feminine sign, but it's ruled by Mars. This gives you the, the, the most interesting flavor of Scorpio. Um, it, it is a feminine sign with very pronounced masculine tendencies. This is one of the reasons why Scorpio tends to make so many people nervous, uh, is that it can produce a very confident, in particular, uh, very sexually confident women uh, though not always, that is another story. But in any event, we have this uh, wonderful balance now with Mars, Venus, and Neptune holding, uh, briefly anyway, an aspect pattern made up all in the feminine signs. Again, Mars and Scorpio, and then Venus in Capricorn, and then Neptune in uh, in Pisces. So uh, that's, that's a nice quality of our... Um, troubled moment here on the planet. All right, next chart is when the moon enters Sagittarius. So we, we get, you know, the, the moon moves through a sign that usually takes about two and a half days, and the, uh, the moon enters Sagittarius on the morning of December 3rd. So the moon would appear to be quick. It's just 48 hours from Wednesday morning to Friday morning that you can tell just from that that the moon is uh, moving quickly, it's closer to the Earth. Slow moon, the moon takes a full two and a half days to get through a sign. Quick moon, a little over two days to get through a sign. It's fun to study the ephemeris, something that very few astrologers do, uh, to notice these things. And uh, you go to the back and you look at the daily, you know, the daily motion of the planets, and you find out that the 
that that the moon can go either just under 12 degrees a day or just over 14 degrees a day. So that's uh, quite quite a bit of uh, variance there, about eight hours of variance, if I'm uh, thinking this correctly, ahead of breakfast. Okay, so the moon enters Sagittarius on the on the morning of the third Eastern time, 7, 12, 33 a.m., uh, just at sunrise, actually, at the exact moment of sunrise, at least here on the East Coast, the Sun and Mercury are in a conjunction. The Sun-Mercury conjunction has just happened, by the way, so we're at the midpoint between the Mercury retrogrades. Um, and uh, and then Moon enters Sagittarius. This begins the new Moon phase, in my opinion. And so the uh, the new Moon phase... Uh, last also last couple of days, but this takes us through to the eclipse, and the moon will enter Sag at 7.12 a.m. Eastern Time, and then it'll form a conjunction to the sun at 12 and change, Sagittarius, to 2.42 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a south node eclipse, as mentioned in Sagittarius. It is a total eclipse. It is conjunct Vesta, though that conjunction is separating, it is also conjunct Mercury, though Mercury is pulling away from the Sun. And the whole arrangement is loosely square Neptune. So is there really such a thing as loosely square Neptune? Uh, I think that Neptune has the widest orb of influence of all of the planets. Uh, I have learned this from long experience to take anything that is even in the sign that is square Neptune. We're a lot closer than the sign that's square Neptune. So it is definitely in the sign square Neptune. That's Sagittarius and, and, and Gemini. This is Sagittarius. However, uh, this, this eclipse is uh, an eight degree square from Neptune. Most, most astrologers would say, oh, well, that's not really a square, but it is the sun. It is the moon and it is Neptune, those are the three points with the widest orb of influence as far as uh, my experience is concerned, not in theory. So we've got this uh, powerful eclipse, but it's making an approximately 90 degree angle to Neptune. Uh, this is strong encouragement to be realistic and to keep your practical senses with you and among you in you know, any relational dealings that you may have. All right, that is my kind of somewhat circumspect, roundabout, slightly disorganized presentation on Sagittarius Total Solar Eclipse Part 1. Uh, I'll be back on Friday with another StarCast, Sagittarius Solar Eclipse Part 2, with additional thoughts and I'll be back with a new episode of PlanetWaves.fm. I've had a couple of weeks off from the program. Great stuff on the cover of PlanetWaves.fm, including the Laniakea interview um, with Professor Brent Tully that I have resurrected for you, um, and uh, a bunch of other good stuff, including a full day of, of uh, talks that I recorded about a week and a half ago at a thing called the Arclight Benefit. That's also on planetwaves.fm. Some very interesting speakers um, for you to hear. And I get I got to introduce one of my professor friends, uh, and that would be Professor Mark Crispin Miller of New York University. Once again, planetwaves.fm. Did I say that? Okay, so thank you for tuning in. Keep an eye out for the monthly horoscope on uh, on on Thursday night and uh, I am off to eat breakfast and spend another day at the races. Thanks for listening. Lots of love from Kingston, New York and stay in touch. <laughs> <laughs>